then. So hello, my name is Shaheen Parekh and um, today I've been invited along to speak to you about the reflections on EHCV, uh, EHCP COVID risk assessments. Um, so um, before I launch into my presentation this afternoon, I just wanted to share a little bit about myself and, and my role at the local authority. Um, so I am a relatively new member of the team at the local authority in, in education and skills. Um, and I have a, a fairly interesting remit. So I'm, I'm the responsible officer for NQTs from September, they will be ECTs. Um, I also support SEND across the city, but I, I'm involved in lots of interesting experiences in, in, in and around um, uh, Derby City in terms of nursery schools and secondary schools, predominantly really. So, um, and I've also this year had um, the opportunity to work in some SEND peer challenges, which has been really interesting. And I know today throughout the presentation, there's been some interesting conversations around the impact that that has had in the city. Um, on the call with me this afternoon is uh, colleague Wendy, um, who will be uh, checking out the chat for us and moderating um, the conversation for us. So um, if you would like to ask a question, um, please feel free to do so via the chat function. I unfortunately cannot see anybody's faces right now. I can just see my presentation. Um, so please do put any interesting thoughts, questions, queries uh, in the chat, and then we'll address that towards the end of the presentation or drawing, um, yeah, which could probably be quite helpful. So. In terms of the reflections for EHCP risk assessments, the first thing I thought it'd be interesting to consider is, well, what are the EHCP COVID risk assessments and, and what function did they play in the city? So um, this presentation is talking about the strengths of those EHCP risk assessments, but potentially also our developments moving forward as a city. Um, so I'd just like you to take a moment, please, um, just to consider actually the purpose of a risk assessment. Now, if we were in teams, I'd be able to see colleagues in the chat and, and then potentially I'd call upon you to share uh, your thoughts here. But if I could just get you to take 30 seconds to consider what generally is the purpose, the function of a risk assessment and what should be included and why. Um, if you'd like to share your thoughts in the chat, please do, but I'll just give you 30 seconds to do that now, please. Okay, Wendy, just let me know if there's anything interesting that pops up in, in, in the chat or, or, or some comments. But at this stage, um, we, we think that risk assessments are actually that. They're identifying potential issues that could be foreseen in a situation, in a school, in, in an environment. So these COVID risk assessments came into place in Derby City um, on the 23rd of March, 2020 that dreaded day in our history that will forever be etched in our minds. So I'm sure that schools were considering those before the 23rd of March. However, this brought all of our, well, every single working situation into the forefront of what we needed to do for the young people of Derby and, and, and across the UK. Um, so schools were being told that they would be closed, but they would be open for key worker children. So very, very quickly, colleagues across the city, and we'll focus on Derby, needed to very quickly pull together plans of action to support our vulnerable children in the city. Now, at that time, it wasn't very clear what the expectation was in terms of what we'd be facilitating for key worker children. Quite frighteningly, 18 months on, we, we have become experts in knowing what we need to do for the young people. But at that time, we needed to hit the ground running and put together a plan of action to support children. So as a city, we got in touch with schools because everybody needed to act quickly. We, we needed to support this idea of the Coronavirus Act of 2020 and being able to deliver provision and making reasonable endeavours in our school to support very challenging, well, to support very vulnerable children in the city. So the Coronavirus Act of 2020, which seems like, gosh, it feels like yesterday, but actually a distant memory all at the same time. It meant that there were temporarily suspended aspects within what our statutory expectation was, 
but we also needed to make reasonable endeavours to try and secure provision for children in schools. Now, I'm, I'm not going to read that information to you, and it was really interesting putting this PowerPoint together because actually there's so much information out there now, but schools very quickly needed to pull together documents to explain to us what they would be doing for their education and health and care plan learners. So just to kind of explain to you the bones of this, really, because I'm sure all colleagues are aware of what they needed to do because they were doing it. They, they, they were outward facing colleagues doing all of this work is the focus was on education, health and care plan learners. It wasn't statutory and it still is not statutory, but it was recommended by the local authority. Ideally, we wanted to, it to be a one page document and it was about the mitigation that would be put in place to support learners um, during, a, during um, a very unstructured time in their lives. And actually, the, at the core of that documentation, it was about ensuring those children and young people were safe, but we needed to support them with attendance, engagement and, and, and learning. So they were the objectives that we were provided with. That's what that's what we were working towards. Now, I have to say at this stage, I wasn't at the local authority um, at that time. Um, I've come into the city. Well, I've been in the city for a long time, but certainly as a local authority colleague, I joined in September. So I inherited um, the, the role, the very interesting role of looking over those risk assessments and actually reaching out to schools to see whether they were still using them and, and how we could develop them. Um, but in Derby at that time, we were loaned two HMI colleagues um, and they, along with colleagues at the local authority, Joe Ward, uh, Paula Nightingale, um, reviewed all the documentation that was submitted to the local authority by schools um, who had children who were in possession of education, health and care plans. Um, that documentation was reviewed and um, all of that information was recorded on a centralised spreadsheet and it highlighted strengths and areas for development. Um, I think what's really important is all schools received individual letters of feedback um, and it highlighted, well, first of all, it thanked them for, uh, for working so hard and so quickly uh, in very challenging circumstances. And it highlighted the strengths of the, that documentation, excuse me, and also the areas of development. Um, and that's the important bit to kind of consider as we move forward. Excuse me. So in terms of strengths, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of risk assessments across the city, and there were lots of strengths. Um, and actually, I would have um, had pages and pages of, of slides if I'd gone through all of them. But to select a snippet of what were identified as strengths is they were clear working documents. They were user friendly. Um, generally, in most settings, that documentation was completed by the same person, which is always useful because that person generally has the overview of the school and those young people. And in most situations, that was the SENCO or a member of SLT. Um, and there was clear knowledge, understanding of the children and young people, which was absolutely important and actually shone through in most of the documentation that was submitted. And in most situations, risks had been considered, which is quite fitting because these were um, risk assessments. So schools had identified potential risks and had put in uh, strategies, mitigation to try and support those risks moving forward. But in, in all documentation, um, th there's always room for improvement. And actually, there were two links well, there, there were two areas that were identified by those colleagues that looked at that documentation. And generally, it was links to outcomes in, in terms of EHCP plans and um, co-production with parents, carers and external agencies. Um, and that's where this conversation is going to change slightly in terms of not necessarily just focusing on the risk assessments, but actually considering something that's really important for us as a city moving forward, I believe, which is co-production with parents, carers and external agencies. As schools, you are working hard all of the time and you are forming relationships with everybody all of the time, because that's what we do as schools. We're at the heart of a community generally and we work with our parents, but it's considering how we continue to develop those relationships moving forward. So in terms of the COVID risk assessments, this was the assessment criteria um, that was used. I, I say criteria, they're statements um, that um, was used to look at those risk assessments. If schools haven't received a copy of this documentation, I'm very happy to send it out. So please don't feel the need to copy anything as such. 
Um, but this information has been really useful for schools moving forward because I have been reaching out to schools since September and I've been working with SENCOs and members of the inclusion team to look at uh, existing COVID risk assessments and considering this information in developing that. Um, Wendy, I'm just going to pause there for a moment because I can hear some noises in the background, but I don't know if there are any questions at all. No questions on the um, on the chat or the Q&A. However, if you are listening, you haven't got your microphone turned off, could you please just pop it on mute just so we just don't get that feedback? OK, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, but no, no questions so far. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so in terms of um, going back to what HMI had identified when they came into the city last year, they looked at all the documentation, um, which wouldn't have been a small task. And they identified some examples that they were particularly interested in at the time that they felt were quite strong. Now, I, I share this. Sorry, I don't quite know what I've done there. I share a quick screenshot of this documentation because this was produced last year, so it's obviously dated now. Um, but there were three examples that um, they liked, and I've, uh, I've agreed with schools to share those with you. Um, and I've only got two there, actually. One is a primary example and one's a secondary example. I share these with the caveat that these are not examples that the local authority is saying any schools need to copy as such, um, but they were just examples that some colleagues had identified as being strong. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I have been working with schools since September and I have been sharing these example materials. Uh, if you are one school that hasn't necessarily had a meeting with me and, and you'd like to follow this up and would like to have a copy of this sort of information, I'm very happy to share because as I say, I have got these um, examples here with the agreement of the schools. Um, so these are examples that you can look at um, if you are developing your documentation moving forward. So I'm just going to pause here for a moment. It'll allow me to have a quick drink, but also get uh, colleagues to um, have some thinking time, really. So questions I'd like you to consider, please. As a school, have you maintained the EHCP risk assessment documentation? Um, who has been part of the process of completing that documentation, drawing that working document together? Um, did you use the feedback letter that you received as a school to adapt your uh, risk assessments? And do you see a place for the COVID risk assessments for EHCP learners now? Um, so there are four bullet points there. If I give you, I'm not very good at maths, um, if I give you a minute um, to just consider that. And, and then if there's any comments, please put them in the chat um, and I'll call upon Wendy. Um, and if not, we'll move on to the next slide. Wendy, I don't know if anything's making an appearance in the chat at all. I'm sorry, I can't see anything. It's, there's there's nothing in the chat, no. No, that's that's fine, that's fine. So okay. moving forward then. So in terms of schools and what you do as a school, I'd like you to consider how your school, your setting engages with parents and carers. What strategies do you do to engage with parents and carers? Um, and how do you support collectively? Um, because I know that there's not been any conversation in the chat so far, these are just kind of thoughts that I'd like you to carry with you as we, we carry forward through the rest of the um, PowerPoint. So in terms of the SEND code of practice, and we'll all be familiar with that because we're like-minded colleagues and we're supporting inclusion and SEND across the city, there are lots of elements to that documentation. And um, I didn't want to obviously go through that with everybody, but what's really, really important to consider and everybody is considering it, I'm sure, is that idea of collaboration for that young person to meet their needs. So in the code of practice, it doesn't just place the onus on the school. It doesn't obviously place the onus on the young person. It's a collective 
team, and I like that phraseology, this idea of a team working collectively to meet the needs of a young person. And parents should be at the heart of decision making and they should be consulted and they should be considered when making decisions about children. Linking that to the um, risk assessments that were completed by schools, we need to ask ourselves, were parents considered in the decisions that were made about their children? Were they given a voice? And if they were given a voice, that's brilliant. Was that necessarily made obvious in the documentation that was produced and that was shared with the local authority and, and those HMI colleagues that came into the city? Or actually, wasn't it was it not explicit and did we need to make it more obvious that consultations did take place? As somebody that works at the local authority and has the great privilege of actually going into schools and working closely with members of the inclusion teams across the city, and I've been facilitating um, SEND peer challenges, it's been a brilliant opportunity to speak to SENCOs, parents, pupils, teaching assistants, teachers about children with SEND needs but actually talking to the parents about their voice and how their voice is listened to in schools. And I'd like to say nine times out of 10, they do feel like they are listened to. But actually, there are parents sometimes that feel that they aren't listened to and they're not necessarily consulted about their child. And actually, we need to ask ourselves in this partnership work to meet the needs for young people, we should be actually using parents as partners in education and actually not necessarily doing a process to parents but actually being collaborative with parents and that's easier said than done so and i and i appreciate that as somebody that has very recently left a school uh, classroom and actually also somebody that's led a project across the city where parental engagement and working with parents was something that I focused on for 18 months and nobody's saying that's easy at all. I, I for one, recognise that. Um, but I'm hoping that I'll be able to share some information with you that talks about the, the way in which you can go about doing that. So this is just a summary and I'm, I'm not going to read it to colleagues because this, this PowerPoint will be made available to you, I'm sure. But it's about the vehicles in which your school has to share information with uh, families, parents, carers. So your send information report will be something on your website, web website, outwardly facing, anybody can access that. So how accessible is that for parents? Do parents know who they can contact in school should they need to? Do you actively as a school make contact with parents? Now, I'm very lucky, and this is something that I'm very interested in, because a few years ago, I completed a master's in parental engagement, and I spent a lot of time looking at research into how we can get parents' interest, well, gain their trust, and get them working collaboratively with schools. And I keep using that phraseology of collaborative, because um, as one theory says, um, working with parents should be a mutually beneficial relationship because actually you're working for the same goal and the same purpose and that's what has been recognized in Derby City that we need to develop moving forward this idea of how we can work as partners with parents and carers um, to support the young people of Derby. Now nobody is stating at all that it's not a challenge engaging with parents because actually we've just worked we're working through a pandemic currently and i'd like to say that we're coming out the challenges of that now because actually good things are happening and and, and covid jabs and everything else are making things safer for us all um but and involving parents has probably been well will have been an absolute challenge for all schools across the city um beyond derby um but i just want us to consider um, what Lucas has said in, in this particular quote, the idea of the difference between primary and secondary schools. Now, I recognise as a former secondary teacher that it could be quite challenging to engage parents in different spheres of education within school, because actually it's not the same as necessarily being at a primary school. As a mother of a year six child currently, I know that I have regular opportunities to have a dialogue with my son's school teachers. So whether that be a drop off, a pick up, um, being involved in um, an opportunity to meet various different teachers in the school um, and actually being given an opportunity to maybe listen to the children read historically or be involved in school trips. I, I certainly feel that 
sometimes there have been more opportunities to be involved in my child's learning from a primary perspective. However, secondary school is a very different experience. It's on a larger scale. And um, now you're dealing with uh, what Lucas refers to as hormonal teenagers who don't want their parents necessarily being involved in their school setting. So I, I absolutely recognise the challenges of potentially involving parents, maybe at a secondary level, but also we've had a pandemic to work through. So consulting parents during potentially this EHCP risk assessment time was going to be very challenging. And you, and it's recognised absolutely that you had strict deadlines to meet because you were asked to produce this documentation. You did under time constraints and, and that was submitted. However, were parents missing from that dialogue? Now, really, really interesting document that, that I've read and really found interesting over the years. It's slightly dated now. However, really, and I, I direct you to go and have a look at this if, if you've not read it before, this, this idea of do parents know that they matter? Um, this documentation lists some really interesting headlines for schools and parents to consider. Um, and I don't think this is news to any schools across the city. Um, and I know working in partnership with parents and carers is generally on schools radar that they want that to be a school priority. But there have been challenges this year. So it's just really a reminder in terms of um, some key headlines. I think schools just yeah should consider. So I, I won't read those to you, but it's the idea of what can we do to engage parents more in working collaboratively in school. So I'll just give you 30 seconds to just quickly read that. As I was putting um, this information together over the weekend, it just reminded me of such interesting theory that I've been reading and, and, and research that I've read that actually seems timeless in some situations because we all want to make sure all of our learners are successful, particularly our SEND learners. But it's just about reminding us about key information sometimes because when we're living it day in, day out, sometimes it's difficult to recognise what can help support the processes that we've got in school. Um, I think this is really interesting and something that I've identified across the city as being really strong practice. This idea of a non-teaching colleague that's a link worker, even within a SEND provision in the school, that's, that's that go between between school and home. And the fact that they aren't all necessarily teaching staff, so their non-teaching staff means that they don't have that commitment of being in a classroom. So when a parent or carer does call upon support, they are available. In some secondary schools, that could be pastoral members of staff, but actually in some schools, they call those colleagues family link workers, which for families can be quite encouraging. And in some schools I've been in recently, that colleague is placed in the foyer of a school and they are available to speak to parents immediately, which I think is really, really strong. The leadership team needs to help support driving this change forward. And in all schools, leadership teams will want parents to be involved in supporting their young people. But it's just that reminder that actually collectively we can make a difference. And if it's from a higher level and it filters down into the school, that, that that's powerful. And I, I like this idea of this culture of consultation. It's about parents feeling like they are listened to, but then working collaboratively. It's about giving parents a voice. Now, I, I have mentioned the challenges that we're all gonna face, and actually it is challenging and we are coming through a pandemic, but we just need to recognize this idea that working together will hopefully make a difference. COVID's not going anywhere, unfortunately, and across Derby City, we've started to see it. And, and it's not necessarily secrets because through Joe's bulletin that goes out weekly, you will see that COVID in Derby is on the rise. And unfortunately, that means sometimes young people are not necessarily going to be in school because, well, for their own safety. So we need to have that and a working document in place that so we know what we need to do to support those young people moving forward. And actually that working document then is ready and anybody can pick that up at any time. But parents need to be party to that because they need to know what expectations are placed upon them. And actually we have to remember that 
we sometimes take for granted that we can just be very proactive with young people and do what we need to support their learning. But for parents, some of whom may have had very challenging experiences of secondary school, of primary school, that can be a little bit more of a challenge. So they need to be aware of what expectations are placed upon them to support their child's learning at home. And so it's all about this idea of being family centred and working collectively, but having a shared vision. So I just really think it's important that we recognise the importance of working with parents. But I, I keep saying that I recognise the absolute challenges of working with parents um, because sometimes they can, their, their expectations can be um, unrealistic in a busy school setting. Um, and for them, their child is their lives, hopefully. Um, but actually for you, you've got children on roll potentially in a primary school of 600 of a secondary school of 1,500. So it's about making sure you consider all of the young people in front of you. I'm going to pause there for a moment because I'm very conscious that I've done a lot of talking so far and not asked Wendy if there are any comments in the chat. So sorry, Wendy, I, I got very overexcited. It's not a problem. It's really interesting. Um, so no, there's, there's no real sort of uh, any questions. Um, again, Joe's just mentioned the fact that, you know, we've got, um, we're starting to see bubble and geo group closures again this week. So you know, there will be a need for all of this to be constantly on our radar moving forwards. And also the challenge of, you know, work, working alongside the parents to making sure that, you know, that, that those realistic, those needs are met and, and parents are kept as, as informed as possible. I, I guess. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. And I am sorry, do feel free to interject whenever. I can't see anybody except my PowerPoint. So that's why <laughs> I'm, I'm rushing ahead. Sorry. Um, so in terms of um, working with parents, now, as I've mentioned to you, I am very privileged and, I, and that's how I feel privileged in terms of the role I have currently working at the local authority, because I, I've had an opportunity to be in strategic meetings, but also those conversations with parents. I've, I've been invited to a number of reviews, annual review meetings, actually, just to observe and to see how schools facilitate them in, in, in different ways. And it's been really interesting to see how schools manage parental expectation. But actually, sometimes it's some simple suggestions, really, that can change the dynamics of a conversation or a, a, a support network with schools and parents. Um, so this is and this is not me trying to tell colleagues anything potentially they don't already know. This is just a reminder of um, how we can make potentially work with challenging parents and hopefully try and diffuse some challenging situations. Um, that can potentially arise. So it is things like having an open dialogue with colleague, uh, with parents, not as a school getting defensive, um, coming prepared to meetings, I, I, and certainly the language that you choose to use in a meeting. Um, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago in which um, a colleague was explaining to a parent, unfortunately, a, a school placement wasn't going as successfully as it could have done. But unfortunately, the language in which they use wasn't necessarily accessible for that parent. And then, unfortunately, the dynamics of that meeting weren't as productive as they could have been. So this is just about potentially considering how we could break down barriers and involve parents in conversations about children. The thing is, we are inclusive colleagues because that's what we're all about. We're attending an inclusion uh, conference today. So generally, we know this, but it's just a reminder, excuse me, not necessarily for yourselves, for the wide communities in schools, because it's all about all of us having open dialogues with parents and carers in school, whether that be from the pastoral team and members of SLT, classroom teachers, teaching assistants, reception staff. So it's about how we want to make schools inviting places and we want to have parents collaborate with us and not necessarily, well, we don't want to exclude them. We want them to be a part of that journey with, with us as practitioners, but also with their children. So just want to take um, colleagues, well, get them to take a moment to consider how you as school leaders, SENCOs, teachers, teaching assistants work co-productively with parents? How do you work collaboratively with parents? What do you do to support them? And how do you work 
together in unison to support a child. So I'm not going to necessarily take any responses because I know we've not had any. Nobody can talk to me except Wendy. But if you've got any ideas that you'd like to share, please put, the, put them in the chat. Anything, Wendy? Uh, there's nothing in the chat, but just um, for my comment, if that's OK. Yes, absolutely. But from last year, working in a school before I moved into higher education. Um, yeah, I we used to have just uh, sort of open drop in sessions for parents mm -hmm. where you know, we, we had just some time at the end of the school day that you know, sort of, we, we made sure the parents were aware of it. Mm -hmm. And also before school as well, you know, there's mm -hmm. always somebody around um, a, a drop off time. Yeah. as well as pick up time that you know if it was quick or it was um just you, know, you, you don't want those um false rumors yeah. you know one parent speaks to another and speaks to another yeah. and then the, the comparison starts and obviously you know you, you can't compare no, situation against yeah. situation so it's about sort of just and it wasn't that onerous it was literally just 15 20 minutes at the start yeah. of the end of each day where we just had that time where parents could have the phone or they could drop in yeah. and i think that's important ways. isn't it it doesn't need to be time expensive no, it needs no, to be available sure. in the school day so just out of interest yeah. then wendy was this a primary school or a secondary school secondary school oh that's interesting and did yeah, you find secondary, that parents send. Were secondary send school so oh. it's a special school here in in, in derby city mm -hmm. so it was I mean, we just made it really clear for the parents and you know it, it wasn't you know or you're the class teacher you have to speak to that parent yeah, we yeah. worked together as a team you know sometimes the teacher assistants had more of a you know more knowledge of a situation or maybe another colleague did so it was about just having that open dialogue and, and we had that sort of very business-like sort of 10 or 8 you know sort of so first mm -hmm. thing in the morning just getting together just sharing that information out so parents did come mm -hmm. signpost them to the right person or we could answer something mm -hmm. yeah you know, brilliant. Like, well, directly yeah that, that, that's brilliant and that's a lovely example thank you so actually that's not the ownership that that's not the onus on one colleague in the school it's about a collective kind of approach and i, I like the idea of a breakfast club a lunchtime club an after school one dropping coffee events there are opportunities that we can create in our school day to day to allow parents and carers to get involved however i, I recognize this covid and we can't necessarily have face-to-face -face kind of meetings currently but potentially moving forward when the world returns to our form of normal we can kind of encourage that participation so i've already mentioned in terms of the send information report that all schools publish and is on their website um, and, and, and has to be on the website. I just want you to consider how accessible that is for your parents. That report is for parents and carers to share what you do as a school to support SEND. Um, and I have seen some fantastic examples of that across the city. I mean, as, as I've mentioned to you already, the SEND peer challenges have been a really brilliant experience to see the fantastic work that is taking place across the city. And some of those reports are just so creatively presented um, for somebody that's had to look at a number of them um, over the last six months. Um, it's those, you know, that documentation that's considered potentially for a diverse community. So, you know, the parents that don't necessarily speak English as their first language or the parents that don't have the strongest linguistic background. So actually they find reading uh, quite challenging. It's about how those SEND reports have been made accessible and they, they signpost as well, which is really, really important because if a parent or carer can't get in touch with a colleague at the school, they will go straight onto the website, I would hope, and access that information. So it's one, making sure it's up to date and has the key information it needs to have in. Um, but two, that kind of accessibility for parents. I've seen some really interesting um, reports where parents have actually featured in that and there have been video recordings or pupils have featured in that and there have been live conversations with them. Really creative ways to kind of engage parents um, but involve them in the process and I think that that's just something to consider and something that, that's been really interesting kind of as, um, as, as something I've identified looking at send peer challenges. Now I did have a number of slides in terms of exclusion data for send um, just because I thought it'd be interesting to share that as we've been talking kind of about SEND in general today. Um, but my colleague Ellen Wilkinson has shared some up-to-date information today and the information I shared was a month out of date. So I, I've quickly uh, removed that information. But it's important to note that there are changes in patterns 
in terms of um, send and um, the information that we have about the exclusions of our send learners. And um, I'm not going to make reference to that now, actually, because Ellen's got some really detailed information that she is able to share and she did facilitate a workshop this afternoon. So if you'd like more information on that, um, Ellen Wilkinson, who's the manager of in -year Fair Access and Exclusions, would be able to share that with you. Um, so I've, I've, I say thoughts, but I've tried to include that throughout the presentation today. Um, Wendy, I don't know if there's anything in the chat currently. There's nothing. There's nothing in the chat. No. Does anybody have any comments or, or questions for Shaheen? That would be. Um, yeah, now's the time. I think we're a small group, so we, you could pop your mic on if needed. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm conscious that it's it is nearly three o'clock at the end of a very busy day. Um, so um, d d don't worry if colleagues haven't got questions and I I'm going to have my contact details at the end anyway. Um, so just to remind people then, there are organisations that you can call upon to help support with parents and actually direct them to for independent advice. Had a really, really interesting conversation with Michelle Lowe uh, at Sendias, um, who I spoke to before putting this presentation together. And she is saying that actually, as an organisation, they would be very willing to come into schools and support pop-up events or parent evenings um, to just signpost families, but just pr pr provide that independent kind of um, advice. Um, but also, they would be very happy to come and support you as um, SEND leaders in school, inclusion teams in school. Um, so if you've not done so before, reach out to Michelle because she's very receptive and working more closely with schools. And I know she's keen in developing that. Um, so as I draw to an end of this presentation, and this has been quite an unusual presentation for me because I can't see anybody, um, but um, I've, I've been able to share lots of information. Um, COVID risk assessments were something that came into play in the city this time last year. Well, I say March of last year, and they were looked at as a local authority and some HMI colleagues also looked at that documentation and identified absolute strengths. But one area for development was co-production with parents. So hopefully you've been able to see the link that I've made today in terms of how we can actively encourage and engage parents into processes within schools. Um, had it have been teams, I was hoping we could have had a bit more of a, a collaborative conversation and, and done some sharing. But unfortunately, this process hasn't loaned itself to that. Had it have been face to face, maybe as well, we could have done that, could have done some brainstorming and things. But there is excellent work taking place across the city where schools are inviting parents and carers into the school community and working with them collaboratively. Now, through annual reviews and, and you know those three meetings a year that take place with senkos and parents that's really positive and that focuses on documentation but can we create other opportunities whereby parents and carers can have a bit more of an active dialogue with schools throughout the year um if you would like some support with that, I'm more than happy to help support as and where I can. Um, I'm hoping you can tell I'm quite passionate about this area and I've done lots of research and reading to this. So if I can be of some support, please call upon me if I can be helpful. Um, Sendias and the Parent Carer Forum contact from parents is on the increase. And um, I just think that was worth noting. It's also worth noting that um, the SEND team at the local authority are generally contacted more. I've spoken to Dan Marson by parents. And so the, he, he was asking the question, parents are coming directly to the SEND team at the local authority as opposed to going to their school sometimes. So is that potentially an area that schools can develop as well and question why? Because actually another trend that he identified um, was that there are more parents in the city than in previous years that are applying for education, health and care plans themselves. So it's the questions, why the parents applying for that? As a school, are you aware of that? Because actually in some situations, schools aren't aware of that. So it's, it's about developing that dialogue. Um, and send yes are willing to help schools. They, they, they mentioned things like coffee events and drop-in sessions and attending parents' evenings to help support schools. So I suppose the question, what I'm trying to say is, I hope you realise that you're not alone and there are colleagues across the city that will help support schools developing relationships with parents. And this was one of my favourite quotes um, when I did um, my studies in this um, a few years ago. Um, it's about working together um, and actually 
being collaborative. So um, I'll leave that with you there because I just think that's quite a powerful um, quote. And just to say thank you, because as practitioners across the city, everybody's worked tremendously hard. Not that you don't anyway, but we've worked through a pandemic um, and, um, and we've done great things. And we are still here smiling, fighting fit as, as best we can to support the needs of our children and our communities in Derby. Um, last year, it was Thank a Teacher Day on the 23rd of June. Today is the... 28th of June. So I'm not that, you know, I'm not that late, but I quite liked this image. So I wanted to share it with you uh, to say thank you for all that you do. Um, I hope today has been useful. I hope there's been some information that you can take away. Um, forever the English teacher, I generally have uh, um, links and things to share, um, some of which you will be very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, but I've also got some references in terms of some of the quotes and things I've mentioned today. I have got an extensive uh, bibliography reference list that I can share if colleagues would find that uh, interesting or helpful. Um, so just drop me an email. Um, my email address is at the bottom. And can I just take this opportunity to say thank you for attending. And I hope you appreciate the fact that I've managed to get moving emojis because I was quite proud of that development <laughs> because I, I'm not as technological as I'd like to be. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I